When we mix two substances together, uh, oftentimes what we find is that their interactions with one another are different from their interactions with themselves. So we can't really treat them as though they're ideal gases, even though that makes it very convenient for us to do so. Um, what this introduces for us, though, is this concept of partial molar quantity. So I want to talk a little bit about that and introduce you to the topic. Now, we're already familiar a little bit with this kind of idea. Remember when we talked about the Gibbs energy, and let me write this here as Gibbs energy of temperature and pressure. Uh, when we were talking about multiple phases, we also said that we had to pay attention to the uh, number of moles in the vapor phase, number of moles in the liquid phase, and that as we did this, uh, we might end up thinking about quantities like the chemical potential of the vapor, which would simply be the change in the Gibbs energy with respect to the number of moles in the vapor, with everything else held constant. And the same would be true for the chemical, uh, the chemical potential for uh, the liquid phase. Those would be two different quantities. And this basically arose because we recognized that, um, that our Gibbs energy is essentially an extensive property. That is to say, it depends on the number of moles that are there, and we use the molar Gibbs energy as a way to quantify that, and we associated this with this chemical potential. Now all of that's really tidy when we have just one component, but when we have multiple components, uh, there's a, a subtle difference that we have to take in, uh, into account, and that has to do with this partial molar volume. Let me illustrate this by talking about uh, volume as a quantity that we might be interested in when we mix two things together. I want to uh, propose that, uh, that we're going to mix a mole one mole of water with one mole of ethanol. Okay, ethanol, CH3, CH2OH. All right, if we mix those two together, one mole of water actually has a, uh, whoops, has a volume of 18 mils, and one mole of ethanol has a volume of 58 mils. So we would expect that we mix these two together, we should get something like 76 mils. Okay, that'd be just the sum of those two. And indeed, in the ideal case, that would be true. It turns out, though, that when we actually do this, when we mix this amount of water with this amount of ethanol, in fact, the amount of uh, total mixture we come up with is 74.2 mils. So in other words, these are not equal. This is what we actually get. And the question is, why is that? Well, it turns out that when we mix these two together, the intramolecular forces between water and ethanol are actually stronger than they are between water and water or between ethanol and ethanol. So in other words, these molecules tend to stick together a little bit better. And since they stick together, they don't take up as much space when you mix them together. All right, so how do we... How do we contend with that. Well, first of all, let me draw a picture so that we can begin to see how we're trying to organize this together. Now, this particular mixture that I've talked about is one mole with one mole, so that means the mole fractions, and now I'm going to use x to indicate those mole fractions, are both going to be equal to 0.5, and so this is also the mole fraction of the ethanol. And if you don't mind, I'm going to use ETH to indicate ethanol, so I don't have to write out its formula every time. All right, so both of them have the same mole fraction, and I'm going to make this bottom axis here represent the mole fraction of ethanol in our mixture. So this would be 0.5, where we are. Now, we know that when the mole fraction of ethanol is zero, I've just got pure water in this case. So this is where I'll have 18 mils. I'm, I'm writing on this vertical axis the molar volume of my mixture. All right, I know if I had a mole fraction of 1 for ethanol, then I would have a molar volume of 58 mils. So I know what my limits are. I know I've got to start here, and I've got to end here as I change the mole fraction of ethanol. So I could, in fact, draw a straight line between these, and that might be my expectation if the attractive forces between these molecules with each other are about the same as they are for these molecules with themselves. All right, but instead what we find is a different picture. We find the picture that when we 
vary this mole fraction of ethanol, the actual molar volume of the mixture looks something like this. In other words, it's not up at the line that we expected. So this is uh, a line I'll call the ideal line. This is the real or the actual line that's down here. All right, and this shows clearly that when we're at a mole fraction of 0.5, we're at a smaller volume than we would have expected um, just from having the two um, by themselves. Now, I, I want to make a parenthetical note at this point, and that is that we can also have cases where when we mix two things together, their intermolecular forces with each other are weaker than they are with themselves. And in that case, we would end up with a curve that would come up above the expected curve. So they don't all do this, all right? This is something that is true for water and ethanol, but it may not be true for water with some other substance. All right, so how can we get a handle on this? How can we understand what's going on here? Well, we need to, uh, I guess, first of all, note that the molar volume of this mixture is not just, so let me just say molar volume of the mixture, um, it does depend on temperature and pressure, but I haven't changed the temperature and pressure in doing this, but it also depends on the composition. And so we can think of this now, this molar volume of the mixture, as effectively being, uh, and I'm going to use N1 and N2 instead of N water and N ethanol, but th that's what these two things mean. It's effectively a, 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 excuse me, a function of these two molar amounts. And, and actually, a better way to write this is it's a function of the molar fraction of these two quantities. All right, so that's what we've drawn here. It's a function that is not a line. All right. Now, how would we get a hold of this? Well, one way we could do this is to look at a differential change in the molar volume of the mixture and note that it will be, since it is a function of these two amounts of moles, it might be uh, written this way. Where I'm simply taking the partial derivatives of each of the molar amounts times the increment of moles. All right, and in both of these cases, temperature and pressure are held constant, as well as the other components. So N2 is held constant for this partial derivative, and N1 is held constant for this partial derivative. Or I could actually add those on here. OK, so what are these things that I've drawn here? What is this? What is this thing? Well, this is something that we call the partial molar volume. And what it corresponds to is, if you, you can imagine, uh, let's say I start with a liter of water, and I'm going to add just a little bit of ethanol to it. OK, let's say I'm going to add a mil of methanol to this liter of water. I'm then going to measure the change in the volume for that and then divide by the number of moles. That's what this quantity would be. I'm changing, I'm holding, I should say, holding water constant and adding an incremental amount of ethanol. Okay, so I'm just adding a little bit of ethanol, and I'm looking to see what the molar volume change is relative to the ethanol. Okay, and if I added a mole of ethanol to a liter of water, that would directly give me, um, if you will, the amount of uh, volume change relative to that mole. Now, if I do that for several points across here, I will end up developing this red curve that's shown down here at the bottom. Now, another way that I could represent this is if I were to draw separately the molar volumes of both ethanol and water uh, as a function of uh, the mole fraction of ethanol. So for water, I'm going to have to draw this pretty small. Sorry about that. We start at the mole fraction, or the, the molar volume of pure water, 
and it would go up a little bit and then it would gradually come down. It would actually be smaller as we approached having no water in there and only ethanol. Ethanol, on the other hand, would show basically a mirrored type picture. It would start low it would, and then gradually rise. And at this point, it would be 58 mils, or the molar volume, of pure ethanol. Now, the way we write the molar volume for a pure substance so that we can distinguish it from the molar volume of a mixture, molar volume of a pure substance we will write as V with an asterisk. Okay, sometimes you will see this written as V with a filled in circle, but that's older notation. So if you ever see this in a book, this is what it means. It means the molar volume for a pure substance, or the, the circle here refers to a pure substance, not a mixture of any kind. Okay, so what we're drawing here is basically the molar volume of a substance as the mole fraction of ethanol changes. So this would be the mole volume of water as a function of the mole fraction of ethanol. All right, so when we put all of this together, we can uh, determine a couple of things. First of all, if we had an ideal uh, mixture, that would be the straight line here. In that case, we could write as the ideal um, volume, it would simply be the mole fraction of the water times the ideal, uh, or I should say the molar volume of pure water plus the mole fraction of the ethanol times the molar volume of pure ethanol. That would give us this dashed line up here. That's the ideal case up in this part of the figure. Okay, in the non-ideal case, though, we have something a little different. In non-ideal case, we are going to write this as the mole fraction of the water times its partial molar volume. So in this case, the way we're going to write that is we're going to write partial molar volume, we're going to put a subscript on the molar volume to indicate this is the partial molar volume of the water, and we'll also add in the uh, mole fraction of the ethanol times the partial molar volume of the ethanol. But these partial molar volumes are just these derivatives that we have drawn up here, not some constant value, because the molar volume in the mixture depends upon the composition. So this is the way that we account for that, and we uh, generate these molar volumes this way. Now, I want to return to the very beginning of the talk when we talked about the Gibbs energy and the chemical potential. The actual definition for chemical potential is not, um, as we've written it here, as just that molar volume as a constant, but in fact a more particular uh, definition of the molar volume, say of component one, would be... Uh, would be written like this. It is the partial derivative of the Gibbs energy with respect to the moles of that component with the other component held fixed. So we're not going to make the assumption that the Gibbs energy is just additive, that is to say it's ideal, although I believe in most cases it probably is. However, um, it could be like the volume where there's some other effect going on that means we have to adjust for that using this thing called the partial molar volume or partial molar Gibbs energy to do that. Any of the thermodynamic potentials that are extensive in uh, character um, will have a partial molar uh, quantity associated with them that will be just as I've described it here for the partial molar volume.